morning. Good to be with you this morning. Let's lift up some praise. Show you my 
As I worship your majesty I worship your holy name Jesus my everything All that I am is
individual people and, and you've got to step into it and as we all do you look around and say wow look what God's doing but it always starts with individuals so let's not pray for sing about cry out for revival thinking that God's going to do something that we watch no revival is you doing something that the world watches and they say, God must be in this place. God must be at move. God must be doing something. Oh, come on, let's exercise the spirit of revival right now. Lift your hearts and hands. Tell the Lord how great he is. Tell the Lord how good he is. Worship him, exalt him. Oh, Father, we lift high the name that is above every name. The name that carries with the resurrection power. We lift high the name. That, that can break every yoke of bondage. Lord, I thank you that you are Lord over the earth. You're Lord over America. You are Lord over California. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, that your will, your way will come to pass. Not because someone else is doing it, but because we, I, make a choice to honor you, to worship you, and to love you. Oh, I praise you. I exalt you, Jesus. I love you. I honor you today. I've come to worship you. I've come to set aside all else and to exalt and lift high your name. I've come today to be moved by your spirit. I come today to follow the leading and the direction of the Holy Spirit in this moment, in this church service, as we leave from this place have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying and to move with it. Oh Lord, I come today to be recharged, to be energized by the Spirit of the Lord so that this week as I pray, I know that I am praying the will of God. I know that I am praying the dictates and the move of God. This week, as I declare your word over my life, over my family, my children, my grandchildren, our church, I thank you, Father, that I declare what you are declaring. Oh, I've come to worship you, Almighty God. I've come to worship you, Lord. I've come to exalt your name. Oh, let's sing it again. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We worship you. We worship you. We exalt you, Jesus. We exalt you, Lord. We exalt you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Out. Come now with power, cover this land like the tiny people. Would you do it again? Oh, 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 oh. Most in the Bible, most in it now. Move oh, your God. spirit, we you. heaven break. We worship you, Lord. Come now with power, cover this land like the tiny people. Would you do it again? Oh, 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 oh.
You bring your peace. Come on, let anxiety go. Let worry depart. You walked in with such weight. And the Lord says in a moment, if you'll let go, I'll fill you with my peace in just a moment. In just a moment. Let it go. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Why are you so downcast? Put your trust and your hope in the Lord. Oh, but you would say, I have reason to be discouraged and depressed. There are many things that have hindered and hit me hard. And the challenges that I face go beyond what I'm able to handle. And so in this depleted state, the Lord says, I haven't left. I haven't moved on. I've not lost my trust in you. Don't lose yours in me. For I'm always working, always moving, looking to do a new thing in your life. Let go of the old. For behold, I come. The King of glory comes. The King of kings and the Lord of lords is here to declare over your life, no circumstance, no situation, no person is beyond my reach. I will do what I've declared, says the Lord. So you can wait to be at peace until everything lines up to your liking, or you can be at peace now, today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Oh, we worship you. We honor you today. We lift high the name of the Lord, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just the spirit of peace settles on your people. We thank you for it. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, so be it. So be it. Amen. Hey, listen. Find somebody you don't know. Introduce yourself. Find at least three people you do know. Let them know you're glad they're here at the first service today. Well, good morning, church. It's so good to see you here today. So glad that we can gather together in God's house and be with one another, encourage one another. And so it's a great place to be. Welcome. If this is your first time with us, we want to give you a great big welcome. We hope that you feel right at home and we would love to get better acquainted with you. So if this is your first time here, we ask that you would stop by the Welcome Center on the way out. We have a gift we'd like to give you and we just want record of your visit 
visit with us today, and so welcome. We hope you really experience the love and presence of God here today and really feel at home, so we're glad that you're here. Before we continue in worship with the giving of our tithes and our offerings, want to make <laughs> want to make mention of one thing coming up. August 22nd, we are having a water baptism service out in the courtyard, and so this is your opportunity to declare uh, openly, to make an open confession of your faith and your decision to follow Jesus, so we invite you to sign up for the water baptism. If you have not done so already, you can do that at the Welcome Center, or you can do it online, and so it's going to be a great, great day. It'll be in the evening, I think at 6 o'clock, and worship outside. It's just going to be awesome. So invite your friends, and we, again, encourage you, if you have not uh, been water baptized, we encourage you to do this. And so, ah, it's a good day. We had a great vacation last week. Camping is so much fun, and it's so much work. Uh, you're cleaning and cooking all week long, but it was a blast, hiking and boating and all kinds of things. And so, it's good to be back here, and it's good to be with you today. So God is always good. He is so faithful. We can count on him. We can trust in him no matter what we may be going through. He's faithful in every area of our lives. And so when it comes to our giving, we can trust him with that as well. I mean, he knows what the birds have need of and he provides for them. Will he not also provide for you? And so it's with great joy that we give in the giving of our tithes and our offerings. There are many ways for you to give online at oakvalleychurch.org or on the church app, OV Church. You can text to give. And if you came prepared today uh, with cash or check and you need a tithe envelope, if you raise your hand, our team will be glad to get you one. Or there's one outside in the offering, uh, right beside the offering container and you can just drop it in the box as you leave. But let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good God and you are so faithful. Your grace abounds towards us every morning. You are always full of great extravagant love for us, Lord. It's unconditional love and we thank you for that, Lord. And Father, we just declare with the giving of our tithes and our offerings that we trust in you. You are faithful, Father, and we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for your uh, blessing that you are faithful to meet every need. And so, Father, we just give back into your kingdom, Lord, that great will be the harvest and the results of our act of faith. And we just honor you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we did go on vacation with our 11 grandchildren, soon to be 12. Was I not supposed to say that? No? Okay. With our 11 grandchildren. Sooner or later, they're going to have more kids. So, um, And uh, we were excited. Uh, but not only that, um, my, there are six siblings in my family. I have three brothers and two sisters. Yeah, that adds up to six with me. And... Uh, we, they came with their children and their grandchildren, and we had like, I don't know, was it 80-something people camping? It was absolutely impossible to get anything done in the way that you wanted to do it, because everybody has a different idea about how to camp and how to do things, and Joyce and I, you normally, you know, we just go into our we take our truck and our trailer. We get in our trailer and get away from everybody. When you have 11 grandkids and tents and everything else around you, it's not a good, safe place to go to rest and relax. So, uh, but we had a great, great time. How many of you know that camping is exhausting? It absolutely is. But not only is it exhausting, um, but to get there and to come back uh, can be stressful. And uh, it was pretty stressful at some points. And we're driving up, and Joyce says to me, you know, you just need to, don't be so stressed out. And I'm thinking to myself, you are the source of my stress. <laughs> now, wait a minute before you judge me. And the reason I was thinking that was because she has every moment of every day on vacation planned. We've got to do three hikes today. We've, we've got to get to the lake. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. And I'm Day one, I'm ready to come home. 
but uh, it was fun chasing grandkids around. We had a blast. We're glad to be back. And uh, this morning, I'm going to continue our series on So You Want to Be a Disciple. So You Want to Be a Disciple. And last week, we talked about the spirit of generosity and how important if you're going to be a disciple, that you carry the spirit of generosity. We found out that generosity means to live with open hands. So many people are tight-fisted toward need. God wants us as disciples of Jesus Christ to live not with tight fists, but with open hands to meet the needs of people. And I told you uh, last week, oh, by the way, welcome to our online church. We are so glad you've joined us as well. Um, we are thrilled that you're watching this morning, and uh, I didn't mean to not to to pretend you weren't there. You are there, you're watching, we're excited for that fact. But, But it's important for all of us to know that the requirement of a disciple is to live this way, to always reach out. And we talked about last week how when we built this building, we knew that God would use it for reasons other than just service on Sunday morning. And when the pandemic hit, um, it's amazing to me how then God shifted us and um, we now are serving thousands of people out of this campus, groceries every single week in our community. Um, of course, we had to purchase trucks and walk-in freezers and refrigerators and we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cars lined up on stage. Someday, you need to come on a Saturday morning, get here, oh, I don't know, about seven, eight, nine. You don't need to sleep in on Saturdays. And just take a look at the, the hundreds of cars wrapped around this building, filling the parking lots, waiting for their weekly allotment of groceries. It's amazing, and that's what God requires of a generous people who carry a generous spirit to live with open hands. This morning... We're going to talk and teach on something that I haven't taught on in quite a while, and that is the spirit of faith, and we're going to connect it with grace. Uh, It's important that as we look at the two, what we often think of as contrasting truths, grace and faith, that we understand to be a disciple, you must move in the spirit of faith. Listen, you are part of this body of Christ. You are one of three services this morning, and every single service we should Understand as disciples, we carry a spirit of faith. That means we don't back down from anything. We stand up in the face of challenge. We stand up in the face of difficulty. And we say, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust his word. We're going to get done what God needs to get done. The Lord can count on me. He can count on our church. That's what it means to carry a spirit of faith. Now, mercy is not getting what you deserve. How many of you have done enough things in your life that God should have snuffed you out a long time ago? And yet, because of his mercy, which is the Old Testament equivalent of of the New Testament love, because of his mercy, you didn't get what you deserve. And I'm pointing at myself as well. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. One doesn't get, the other does. Faith is what man has. Both grace and mercy are in the hands of God. Faith is what man has and what man does. So today we're going to see how grace and faith work together. Now, let's go to James chapter 2, verse 17, because the Bible says, thus also faith by itself is if it does not have works, is dead. Right away we discover, I know that much, much of this is going to be simple, much of this is going to be what you have heard over and over again in your life, but I want to bring a, a fresh application. And so what we find out from James 2.17 is that faith is a workhorse. Uh, it's man's part, meaning there's something that you've got to do in order to receive from the hand of God, have access to God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves uh, it is the gift of God. Now the word through here, for by grace you have been saved through faith. The word through uh, uh, actually is dia, D-I-A, in the Greek, and it means the channel of an act. So it, it, the word through is the conduit, it's the channel of, of something happening. What Paul is saying is this. You are saved because of your faith. You're saved because of your faith. 
Now, most translations say, for by grace are you saved through faith. We leave out the because, which the original language identifies, because it creates tension for us. Salvation is supposed to be a free gift, and it is, with our faith as, as the doorway through which it enters into our life. Faith is not the reason that we receive salvation. Faith is the access, the, the access door, the conduit. Faith is uh, really the doorway to receive from the hand of God is salvation. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. I'm just laying some foundation here. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says this. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible the source of salvation is grace. It's free. The access of salvation is faith. So throughout Scripture, human response, your response to the Word of God, your response to the promise of God is key. It's important, your response. Let's go a step further. Plain and simple. Let me just say this, plain and simple. God responds to human response. God responds to your faith. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure word measure is short for measurement. Actually, what it's talking about is God has given everybody a certain amount of faith. Faith, again, is the channel, the open door, the access through which we receive the free gift of God's grace. God's grace is everything that he has. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's grace is all that God possesses that he makes available to us. All of his exceeding great and precious promises. Faith is the access that we receive from the hand of God. And it says here, God's given everybody a measurement of accessibility to the free gift of God's grace, to every single one of his promises. Now, stop here for just a moment. Lest we think that our faith is the biggest key, our faith, understand this. <clears throat> God is the initiator of every promise. Without his grace first, there's nothing to access by our faith. There's, there's no way to get to the promise of God. I don't care how much faith or how big your faith is. Without God being the initiator, there's nothing you can do apart from God. So let's go on. Don't ever look at me or anyone else as some big shot faith person who has all this faith and all, all of this uh, big faith. I mean, I have found in my own life that faith, my measurement, my amount, didn't measure up to the challenge I was facing. I found that to be true in my life many times. Plain and simple, my measurement of faith that God gives to everyone a measurement, my measurement of faith wasn't big enough to meet the challenge. It just wasn't. Matthew 17, verse 20 says this. Jesus speaking, you don't have enough faith. That tells me that different people have different measurements or amounts. For Jesus to say to somebody, you don't have enough faith. It says there are different measurements. Then he says, to tell you the truth, if you had faith, if you had faith, if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. So first of all, he says, you don't have enough faith. And then he says, if you had enough faith. Nothing is impossible to, ac to access if you have enough faith. But in this instance, he recognized they didn't. Their measurement didn't meet the need. 
Often throughout the New Testament, Jesus said to people, O ye of little faith. I'm quite sure he didn't say it in King James language in that way. But, O ye of little faith. He wasn't demeaning people at all. What he was doing was challenging them to increase their faith or their channel of access to his exceeding great promises, his riches. He was challenging them to increase. See, faith is not, listen to me, because I love the faith movement, but every movement comes and goes. And God's always doing something fresh. That doesn't mean the truth doesn't stay. It does. We're more so to mature and, and take what God... See, every movement that happens, every movement that happens, God recognizes that, that there's a pathway for us to go on, to receive from him. But, but he identifies the fact, the body of Christ, we get stuck in ditches real quick. We'll get stuck in this ditch where nothing's happening. Or we'll get stuck in this ditch where we're going 100 miles an hour with no one to follow because we're ahead of God. Well, God wants, remember this, balance. Everybody say balance. Sometimes it's hard to say balance. is not bad. Middle of the road is not bad because if you're stuck in a ditch on either side where you're doing nothing, you're doing too much, what kind of movement do you have? Balance or middle of the road is not a bad thing. It's, it's not at all. So faith is not an arms race. It's, it's, it's not to see. And we, we did this. In every, how many know in every movement of God, there's always going to be people that take it to extreme? And in every movement of God, there's going to be people on the other end who, who say, Oh, that's not God, that's the devil. And where's God want us? In the middle. What's he trying to do? Get the body of Christ moving. So faith is not an arms race to see who's got the biggest, the strongest, and the baddest and most powerful faith, which is what we do. We put people on pedestals. No, faith is man's response to God's initiative of grace. Luke chapter 17, verse 5 says this, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Other translation said, the disciple said to the Lord, increase our faith. You want to be a disciple? Then you need to be increasing your faith. It, it, it's so important that we don't lay down in, in the ditch and just say, well, I've learned all I can learn. I've done all I can do. I faced every challenge I can face, and now I'm just going to put it in cruise control and follow the Lord and sing Kumbaya, it's just not going to work. It's not going to work. We've always got to be on the edge moving, going, growing, maturing. I like to challenge myself. I like, I like to express my faith and trust in God by moving as close to the edge as I can without getting caught in a ditch where there is no movement. Do you want to be a disciple? Increase your faith. It's not an ego thing. It's an access thing. Near his own death, the Apostle Paul said this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure <clears throat> is at hand. Next verse, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept. So you can lose it. You can regress. You can move backwards. I have kept the faith. Now, this is going to be so simple and, and so quick that you're going to say, I already knew that. But my challenge today is, are you doing it? Because movement have, have come and gone. And we, we experience movements of God as a blur and then we just sit around and wait for the next one. We sang this morning, Lord, send revival. Send. Well, you know what? People in the past experienced revival. And then when it lifted, there are a lot of people waiting around hoping that the next one would come because the last one was fun. But you don't get to it unless you're expressing 
the grace of God in your life and in the church by accessing it with faith. You can sing till you're blue in the face, but nothing's happening until you personally take the challenge of, as a disciple, increasing your faith and trust in who God is. So how do you not lose but increase your faith? Because that was the cry of the disciples who followed Christ. I, I want to increase my faith. How do I do it? Well, the Bible gives us four very important but simple explanations. Number one, more word. More word. It's very simple, um, very predictable. More word. Romans 4.17 says this. As as it is written, I've made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Okay, that is a wonderful scripture, but it's not the one that I wanted. And it's my fault. Um, Faith comes by hearing what? The word. Hearing the word. And hearing the word, faith is what? It's progressive. It's, it's moving forward. More word, more word, more word, more trust, more faith in, in God. And I've said this before, and I'll certainly say it again. If there's anything in my life that I want to increase in, um, I'm going to find a good book, or I'm going to listen to some good speakers, and I'm going to stay in it and that'll increase. If, if I want to get healthier than I am, I'm going to find a good book about health and about eating habits, and I'm going to read it, and if it really challenges me and grabs hold of me, I'm going to, I'm going to get to the end, and I'm going to read it again, and I'm going to read it again. As long as I'm reading it, I'm doing what it says. The moment I stop and put it aside, I'm prey to the things that would make me not healthy. And so, Um, Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing over and over and over again the word of God. You need more word. Number two, we're talking about uh, how do you not lose but increase your faith. Number two, exercise the word. Exercise the word. James chapter 1, verse 22 through 24, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. But if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. That's what we were just talking about. You read a book, get done with it, close it, walk away, you forget what you read. You read a book, somebody explains it, it encourages you, it gives you a few little goosebumps that are spiritual, but when it's all said and done, you close the book, go on to something else, and you forget what it said about who you are. In the Lord. You have to exercise it. I just recently uh, saw someone who was a longtime friend. They used to attend our church, moved away, and um, he was a, a policeman. He's now retired. Um, he's one of these uh, guys who are just hard charging, you know. And, he, and years and years ago, he said to me, Pastor, he says, I'm going to get you healthy. I said, Well, I'm pretty healthy. He says, Now I'm going to get you healthy. I said, Okay, what are we going to do? Meet me at the gym, 5 o'clock, five days a week. We're going to get healthy. He was a drill sergeant. It was painful. I had to get up at 4.30 to get to the gym every day at 5. I get up every day early, but I don't want to go work out at the gym at 5. And I, I did it, and I did it for three years. And I got healthy. I was looking good, wasn't I, Joyce? Yes, look at that. What does that what does that big yes say about right now? How am I looking? Oh, she shook her head. No. I oh, anyways. Anyways, I exercised myself and things changed. Progressively, slowly. Things began to happen that were healthy and good, but yet we started small with little weights and then we we increased them. That's what you do with the word. Number 3, We're talking about how do you not lose but increase your faith because that's the cry of a disciple. It should be. It should be. It's test the word. A good illustration to test the word is money. It's money. Malachi 3, 9 through 11 says this. You're cursed with a curse. You've robbed me. You 
your whole nation has robbed me. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this. Try me now in this. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. See if I'll not open for you the windows of heaven. Pour out such a blessing on you that there be no, that there not be room enough to receive it. And then verse 11, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Anytime you see that phrase, Lord of hosts, it's a military term. It's referring to the Lord coming to the, a situation or to a circumstance with an army of angels. Concerning your finances, the Lord will get on his horse with all of his angels, and he'll come rushing to you if you'll do what he said to do concerning the tithe. The army of heaven will work on your behalf. And he says right before the promise, you test me and see if I won't saddle up and come to your aid. The Lord of hosts declares that. So we got to test the word. Allow the word to be tested by doing it. And then number four uh, is don't cancel the word. And that would be with fear. Fear is the biggest canceler of the promise of God. It destroys your access channel. It destroys the access channel. Um, one of the things that I enjoy doing is um, I tell myself uh, I like to go on YouTube and listen to different things people speak and different and I just, it's just enjoyable. I mean it's a grocery store. Anybody never heard of YouTube? Yep. Anyone? Wow. Okay. Okay. All right. Good for you. <laughs> uh, you get the better things to do with your time. Um, any of you detest YouTube? Wow, you're not a very spiritual group. No one detests it. Okay, how many of you enjoy it from time to time? Yeah. How many of you just absolutely love it or obsess with it? Okay, good. Two people, three people. Do I see four? All right, so um, uh, the interesting thing to me about any form of media is that the, con the control of people through fear, it's so amazing to me, um, whether it's truthful or not, people can be controlled by a spirit of fear when they're not living in the spirit of faith. So easily, so easily. Mark chapter 4, verse 40, Jesus said, in a storm, in a challenge to his what? Disciples. So you want to be a disciple? Then hear the words of the Lord. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Where's the measurement I gave you? Have you increased it? Or have you backed away from it and left it alone? Have you kept it as Paul did? Or have you lost it? Why are you so afraid? We've just been through a whole year of COVID-19. And just as we come out of it, Everybody with their masks off, going back to everything that spells normalcy. All it takes is one little word, Delta variant, oh! and we shelter in place again. This time, people are a little bit weary and wary of the whole thing. So um, what uh, has happened now? I just read it this week. Headlines, the first case of a third variant has been reported in the United States. It's three times as strong as the first one. So look, I am not saying today that that the pandemic and, and COVID was not real. It was real. So that's not what I'm saying. I am certainly not saying don't wear a mask because I wore one for over a year. That's not what I'm saying. Every, I've told you from this pulpit over and over again, everybody needs to make decisions. We're, we're big people. We all make decisions for ourselves 
and for our family. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and so I'm not, I'm certainly not decrying that. What I'm saying is, aside from all of that stuff, six feet apart, aside from all that, that, that is not the issue. There's nothing uh, that, that I want to opine about concerning those things. What I'm talking about today is allowing the spirit of fear to grab hold of us yeah. again and again and again and again. And if you do that, it'll never end. As long as the enemy allows you, or as long as the enemy presents to you opportunity to be in fear, and you take him up on it, you're, he's going to continue and continue and continue. I am not saying these things aren't real. What I am saying is, what's most important is that you do not live with a spirit of fear, but rather a spirit of faith, if you're going to be a disciple. When David became fearful, he knew to trust God, Psalm 56, verse 3, says so. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Courage is not the absence of fear. As David and the disciples of Jesus found out, it's just overcoming it. That's what courage is. So don't cancel out your access to God's grace, to his promise, by living a lifestyle of fear. We're all fearful from time to time. I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that when I turn on the news and someone is reading script and tells me, uh, if you have not been vaccinated, you are the reason why everyone's dying and you are the reason, you are, are going to get what's coming next. I, I'm not going to tell you that that does not affect me for a moment. It does. So whatever decision I make about that is up to me. But one thing I cannot do if I'm going to be a disciple is I cannot live with the spirit of fear. I cannot and I must not. So don't, can't, because it cancels out my access to the grace of God, the promise of God, everything that he has for me. Romans 1, 17, they got to, got to wrap this up. Believers, must live in faith. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. <clears throat> Being a person of access to the things of God, whatever they are, uh, is, is a person who's always, always, always increasing their faith. That means they're always, always, always in the word of God. They're testing it. They're exercising it. Which leads to the Wonderful, overwhelming grace of God. We often view God in the Old Testament uh, as a God of wrath. And in the New Testament, a God of grace. Don't we? We often do. Uh, in Tony Cook's book, The DNA of God, he says this. Some seem to believe that God was mean and angry in the Old Testament, but somehow became nice in the New Testament. Well, that's just not the case. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The truth is, God did not undergo a personality change from one age to the next. Noah, in the Old Testament, found grace. And that word grace in the Old Testament Hebrew means favor. It carries with it assist, the, the, the thought of assistance and generosity. The New Testament definition of grace from the Greek means favor and blessing. Despite all of our fleshly nature, despite all of our faith failures, how many of you have had a few? <laughs> despite all of our disappointments, God's grace, because remember, faith is our part. Faith is, is accessing God's part. Despite all of our disappointments and our failures, God's grace, his promises, his riches remain loving, kind, compassionate, merciful, filled with favor and blessing. What changes is not God's hand of grace and promise. What changes is man's faith. We lose it. We decrease it. And, and the point of today as a disciple of Jesus Christ, 
And it's a reminder to you and to me that we've got to keep strengthening and increasing our trust in God. Because I believe prophetically we're moving into the eschatos, a, a time that is the, the end of the end, the last of the last days. There's nothing after this. We, we in the church age... From, from the book of Acts, when it began, we have lived in the last days. But right now, today, we are living in the eschatos, the last of the last days. Meaning there's nothing else after this. Which tells me that things are going to rapidly be happening. The world you and I live in today, could you have predicted it two years ago? Absolutely not. We are seeing things we never would have believed we would have seen. We are experiencing things we never would have believed we would have experienced. This has nothing to do with who's in power, Democrats or Republicans. This has everything to do with a time period, a, a time frame. And yes, there will be a great revival that has already begun to touch down on the face of the earth. There will be a great sweeping move of God. There absolutely will be. And if your heart's hungry and ready, you, you're going to be a part of this great, great move of God. If your faith is ready to receive from the hand of God, you're going to be a part of it. But if you're going to stay in a ditch somewhere and, and just expect everything to be the way it always has been, uh, the, the problem with that in the eschatos, the last of the last days, is you're going to get swept up or swept away and you're going to miss everything that God is doing right here, right now, today. The greatest picture of God's grace to fallen, sinful, hell-deserving man is the cross of Jesus Christ. Galatians 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. In other words, everything that has been a shiny object in my life that I've chased after, I've laid it aside. And this new life that I'm living, the life I now live in the body, meaning on the earth, we're still here, here's how I have to live it, by faith in the Son of God by having continual access to every step God is taking, every move he is directing, everything he is giving for that season, for that moment in your life and in mine. And having access to all that God has, really it just is a beautiful picture of the love of God who does what only God can do, and that is to give by grace himself for me. Remember, your faith is your access to what God is giving. Um, we got home late yesterday, and um, we unloaded trailer I can't, Joy said, do you want dinner? I said, no, I, I don't. I'm just too tired to eat. I laid on the couch. I think I turned the Olympics on. I may have watched 30 seconds of it, and I was out. <laughs> Woke up at 11, and I, I said, and, and I saw Joyce sleeping on the couch as well. I said, how long have you been sleeping? And she says, hours. And uh, so it was 11. I said, well, we better go to bed. Got in bed, slept until my alarm went off at 4. And, and um, I got up to, to pray and fell asleep, as a good disciple does sometimes. I, I read about it in the Bible, at least. And I woke up like this, and I said, oh, got to get moving. Made Joy some coffee. Took it to her in bed and went back and decided try to pray again just a little bit. And just as I started to pray, I heard the Spirit of the Lord say to me concerning this morning and, and the services that we're going to have today to tell you, don't give up. Don't quit 
on that child, on that grandchild, on the promise of God. Don't you quit. Don't you back down. You stand up in the face of the challenge that looks so daunting and so impossible. And at times you feel so helpless and hand-tied because it, it's like you, you, the way you reason it is, it has nothing to do with me. It's them. How can I change them? And, and so we reason it out in that way. But that's not biblical. What's biblical, to, to move a mountain, you, you don't change the mountain. It, it, to, to, to move a mountain, to face a challenge, a, a person has to increase in faith and trust in God. And so really, even though I know they're, the wrong, they're in the wrong, even though I understand that, really, this, the whole thing is in your hands, your faith, you trusting God, you believing God for his promise to come to pass. And here's what God will do on your behalf. He's coming for you. He responds to human response. He's coming. And I love, I love the picture of the Lord of hosts. Listen, keep him on the saddle. Keep him coming. He's bringing angels with him. He's going to see it come to pass. Let's stand together. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the opportunity to receive simple instruction from your word today. We thank you for the reminder of the promise of God. We thank you, Lord, that it's never, never time to quit. It's always time to increase. We love you and we honor you and we worship you today. In Christ Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Lord, do work in our hearts. May a spirit of faith be imparted this moment. Every doubt, every fear, you've been arrested, you must go. <clears throat> the word of God has uncovered you today. And so you must flee. Having received the simple instruction of the word, we rise up. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Your perfect love received removes every fear, every doubt. We're encouraged today. We're challenged today to see things not through our eyes, not through the challenge or the circumstance, but to see things through the eyesight of faith, the channel you've given us to exercise. And it gives us hope. It encourages us every chain that has bound up those who we have prayed for and fought for is broken in the name that is above every name. Every bit of bondage falls off and we will stand firmly entrenched in the power of your word. For as Hebrews 1 says, it your power is your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Close your eyes for just a moment.
those of you who are watching online, those of you who are here physically, I want to introduce you to the one that I love, the one that I serve. His name is Jesus. He is the Son of God. When in Genesis chapter 1, man fell out of a right relationship with God because of sin, because that's what sin does. It separates man from God. We fell out of that perfect union we had with God as his creation, his children. Sin always drives a wedge between God and man. And when Jesus saw that, when God saw that, he, he was so moved with compassion for his creation, for you and I, that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, who out of obedience left the glory and the splendor of heaven and came to this earth to live as a man, a fleshly man, to die a cruel death on the cross so that his shed blood could be the gift that is given to you and I that when received could restore us back in right relationship with the Father. The gift of God, the grace of God is the shed blood of Christ. Now it's time to exercise faith so that the access to a relationship with your Creator can be had. Will you say yes today? The Bible says if you will confess Jesus as Lord, you will be saved. Saved to the promise of God. Saved to all that God has planned for your life. Saved to eternal life. Saved to freedom from sin. Saved from hell, which is eternal separation from the Lord who created you. Will you say yes today to the Lord? online church, those of you who are watching, I'm going to ask you a question. Those of you who are standing here in this place, if you've never asked Jesus to be Lord and Savior, and, and you today want to pray with me and confess your need for the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. See, sin is really not the issue today. Lordship is. Who is the Lord of your life? When you ask Jesus to be Lord of your life, then sin is going to begin to fall off. Jesus covered your sin with his blood. Are you ready? Are you ready? If you're here, if you're watching, and you want a Savior, maybe you've served God in the past and you're not serving him today. You're away from God. You're backslidden. You need to get right with God. If you're here and you want to get right with the Lord, if you're here and you want to receive him as Lord and Savior, if you're watching, I, and you want me to pray with you. I want you right now to lift your hand. Hold it up high. Wave it at me. I want to see it. Who's here? Who's here this morning? Standing in the, in the church building physically. You need Christ. Wave your hand at me. Who's at home watching? Just right then and th right where you are. Lift your hand. Point it at the screen. Say, it's me, Pastor. I need Christ. I need Jesus. Anyone who needs the Lord today? Who needs Jesus? All right. All right, let's pray this prayer together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me, forgiving me, being the Lord of my life. Today, I receive Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God. From this day on, I will serve him all the days of my life. It's in Jesus' name that I pray these things. Amen. Amen. All right, listen, as we dismiss today, if you prayed that prayer and you're here for the first time to come back to the Lord to receive Christ, I want you to come meet me here at the altar. We have a team who would love to look you in the eye say, well done. Those of you who are watching, connect with us. Be sure that you, you let us know that you prayed that prayer. Leave a comment. Call the office. We appreciate you. Thank you for being faithful to the house of God. We love and appreciate you. Have a great, great, great weekend. Uh, week, week. I'm still on vacation. Listen, if you, are, if you are here and need prayer for anything, come to these altars. We'd love to pray with you. God bless you as you go.